Gwen Dyer is a person who's always had my respect and admiration. He's a PhD in military history, and he has taught at military colleges in Canada and the UK, most impressively Sandhurst. He is a columnist with a syndicated column in over 170 newspapers around the world and news outlets. And he is a well-known author and host of television and radio series, everything from war to future tense to the mess they made to the human race and a few years ago the radio series Climate Wars. I admire him for his principled analysis on the military, war, geopolitics, and most recently on climate change. However, this doesn't prevent him from making a misstep from time to time. And I would say one of his recent columns that he published earlier this year is an example of that misstep. In that article, he accused the WHO, the World Health Organization, of being a kind of language police and, in effect, silencing Mike Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State, for insisting on using the term Wuhan virus to refer to SARS-CoV-2 and to the disease associated with it, COVID-19. In humorously speaking, I, I, I always tend to think that he's speaking sometimes with tongue planted firmly in cheek, but he was a bit miffed because his alternative suggestion, the pangolin balls erectile dysfunction Chinese wet market virus, wasn't accepted either. It seems as though the source of his concern, again, although I don't know if this is tongue-in-cheek or not, is that SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and COVID-19, the disease which it's associated with, are not being named for the country and the city in which they have originated. This, in turn, he appears to argue, might, in effect, defect some of the blame which he believes must go China's way for the way it bungled its original response to the virus, the resulting epidemic, and in fact for having the conditions which could make the emergence of this, of this epidemic, this pandemic possible in the first place. Namely the existence of wet markets where you sell all kinds of different exotic animals. Why do I call the conclusions that Gwyndire reaches a kind of misstep. And I suppose you could argue, why would naming it as something like the Shinchanji virus be considered a misstep too? Well, the simple fact is that nomenclature, the process by which we choose the names for different things in the world, is always changing. And the World Health Organization, in their current attempts at naming bacteria, viruses, and diseases, wish to stress that, above all, these things are natural phenomena. And really, when we're talking about these things, we're talking about things which aren't worried about where they come from, so they don't care if they're called the Hong Kong flu. These things don't care about who they infect first, which is why they don't care about being called Legionnaire's disease. And they're not concerned with who found them first, which is why they, I pro they're probably not concerned with being called Kreuzfeld Jakob disease. Viruses and bacteria and diseases just do what they do. And they follow their genetic programming, and they are not programmed to care about this stuff. 
And moreover, many of the names which we initially tag on to new diseases, really they're just plain inaccurate. You may remember in the 1980s, the early days of the HIV AIDS crisis when AIDS was emerging. It first got called gay cancer. And probably there may be some Christian fundamentalists who would be very happy if it were still called gay cancer because it would justify their homophobia. But then when it was also found in persons with hemophilia, Haitians, and heroin addicts, it was clear that pinning the disease on one group just wouldn't work. And even when they used the 4-H acronym to talk about these four groups, homosexuals, Haitians, heroin addicts, hemophiliacs, that fell by the wayside too when, when cases started coming from Africa and it was found that the human immunodeficiency virus was being spread through heterosexual contact. And so we had to throw all that stuff out the window, and we just had to live with HIV and AIDS. And another good one, which is closer to the pandemic that we're dealing with right now, the 1918 flu epidemic which was commonly called the Spanish flu. That's really a misnomer. The virus did not originate in Spain. It just so happened that the Spanish media were the first to report on this influenza because they were a neutral country in World War I, and that first reporting got the influenza virus at that time, unfortunately tagged the Spanish flu. Well, the earliest recorded cases that we know of, at least according to the reading that I've done on it, were in places like a U.S. Army training camp in Kansas, and also a U.S. Army troop transfer and hospital camp in Etat, in the Bologna region of France. So, why aren't we calling it the Kansas flu, or the Etapt flu, or even more generally, the World War I flu? A good case can be made for that. The flu virus was, was being ignored by most of the countries that were fighting World War I. They censored it up because they wanted to keep spirits up on the home front. And it seems as though the deployment of troops back home in the latter half of 1918 probably contributed to the deadly second wave of the flu. And by the way, if you look at the websites of the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, well, they now refer to it as the 1918 flu, not the Spanish flu. And there's evidence emerging now that some of the response of the American government to the initial outbreak of COVID-19 was actually based on a strong anti-China sentiment which could be found in different sectors of the government, including the State Department. Hence, Mike Pompeo's insistence on calling it the Wuhan virus, even to the point of scuttlebutting a G7 communique. I think it's important in this time that we deal with the fact that there is a virus out there. There's lots of documentary evidence about how the government of China bungled its initial response to it, tried to silence people who were warning about it, and 
eventually led to this becoming a pandemic. There's plenty of blame to go around. And we know that much of it lies with the Chinese government. But the fact is, when this virus reaches other countries, it don't care about where it came from. It just does what it does. And it's up to the governments of those countries to develop effective responses. Now, there have been lots of questions raised about how effectively the U.S. government has, re has responded to this, and the U.K. government, and the Canadian government, and certainly the French and Italian governments as well. But I don't think it helps very much to try and put a label on a particular disease possibly out of some kind of commitment to ideology. I just don't think that's going to help. But then, I don't have a PhD in military history. I'm not being syndicated in 170 news outlets and all over the world. What the hell do I know? This is Craig Bartlett, on the outside, looking in. Thank you.